that would be kind of context for the way in which we administer. That's truly a gospel tangent. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we call it that. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Up to this point, we've talked a lot about people who lose their testimony over church history or LGBT issues. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about other types of people who lose their testimony, maybe in a different direction. Some people give the testimony of polygamy and decide to join a fundamentalist sect. So I asked David what advice he has for those types of people. Also, he served as a mission president in Africa and dealt with people who practice polygamy there. And we'll learn more about how the church deals with African polygamists who want to join the church. It's going to be a really fun conversation. I hope you check it out. Well, let me ask you another question. So I recently attended the uh, Sunstone meetings and um, I attended a session in which they had close to a dozen women that got up and stated why they decided to become polygamists. Okay, so there, you know, it seems like sometimes we talk about the left side of the church and the right side of the church. And so I can't tell you how surprising it was to me to hear over and over and over again from these women. Yeah, I took seminary in high school. I got married in the LDS temple. And now I'm a polygamist. <laughs> and I just thought, Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't understand that at all. You know, I, I must I confess, love. I haven't researched that one. <laughs> um, because I think, you know, this does seem to talk about the people who are concerned about the church history and the LGBT issues and, you know, things like that. But there is another side of the church. The church does have to keep a, an eye out the people that believe in the Adam-God doctrine and polygamy and that sort of a thing. Do you have any, anything for them? Um, so I think it's the same thing. I think we um, meet people where they are and try and lift them to Christ. And we do that with compassion and love and the like. And um, I think, um, you know, goodness, you know, Brigham Young thought the Adam God theory was right, huh? So he lived with that for years and years. And we don't worry about Brigham Young's fate. Maybe, maybe some do, but you know, from a traditionally believing perspective, we recognize him as a prophet and a great man um, in the church. And yet, he had beliefs that that he held that now we don't hold. Um, so I think we can tolerate some different beliefs. I know there's groups of people that are concerned that that we've lost the kind of the the revelatory outpouring of the early restoration, and they seek to find that, um, you know, now in their lives. Um, and they're worried that the church is too corporate, bureaucratized, um, managed by committee, and less uh, dynamic as it was in the early church with revelations. We don't have a lot more scripture. Um, you know, we don't have kind of powerful church-wide manifestations. And so I know people are searching for different things. Um, and I think it's inherent that they will, will have people that don't find everything that they want into a community. But I think ministering means that we're compassionate about that. And that if, if there's a group of, of people that um, uh, are not victimed into childhood polygamy but choose that, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but, but I should recognize that they have feelings about it and that they're sincere. Um, and that even though I might disagree, that that's a lifestyle that uh, is a positive lifestyle. Um, uh, I withhold that because it's not helpful for me to express that to them or to try and correct them. It's more helpful for me to build a relationship with them where they can see um, the love that I have of them as an individual, just like our heavenly parents have, and that I can reach and touch them. So. I don't know, some people feel like that's wishy-washy and that uh, I'm not taking a bold enough stand around doctrine. Uh, but when I think about um, what Christ taught uh, when he was on the earth, you know, the first and great commandment is to love God and the second is to love our neighbors. And couched in that love context, unless I have a very specific authoritative role for an individual, 
I think what that means is that I love them. And I find ways to express that. And what keeps me up at night is to find effective ways to express that. Um, and now as I parent adult children, I've lost that authoritative cap, right? I probably lost it far earlier than I thought. <laughs> but I've certainly lost it as I have adult children. Um, and I walk with them. And I love them. And I put my arms around them. And if they make decisions in one way or another, um, if they want to involve me in that, I help them. Um, but when I know that they don't, I don't. So I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure I answered the, the polygamy thing. I, <laughs> I um, you know, mission president in a polygamy country, Sierra Leone, West oh, Africa is right. a Muslim majority country. And we certainly had, um, uh, we would teach Muslims, uh, we would teach people who had either been in or are in a polygamist relationship or grew up as a child in a polygamist home. So, you know, I have my own kind of awareness of what polygamy is and I have no concept of these women at Sunstone <laughs> and what polygamy means for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Since you mentioned that, I'd love to go into that just a little bit. Um, because I know, believe it or not, uh, I've, I've, or at least I've heard, you know, the Community of Christ or the RLDS Church for years denied that Joseph ever practiced polygamy. And then I believe, I want to say it's the 1970s. So John Hamer or somebody will have to correct me if this is not correct. But um, they started teaching in India and places where the, Africa, places that had polygamy. And they said it was, you know, the question is, do you baptize a polygamist? Now, these aren't you know, if they're Muslim polygamists, would um, the community of Christ actually started baptizing polygamists if they promised not to take any more wives? <laughs> so it's interesting to hear that about Sierra Leone. Did, did we have a policy on that? Yeah, we have a policy. We don't baptize people Just who are, yeah, are in polygamy. Um, we can't baptize children that are uh, living in a polygamist home. I remember one of my first Sundays, uh, we went out to a, a branch long ways away from the mission home and and uh, I sat in on the youth class and and it was being taught by this wonderful 17 year old sister you know she you know was doing a great job teaching and so afterwards I asked you know when did she get baptized and she says why well, I'm not baptized really well we'd be happy to teach you you know and and she says well I can't get baptized till I'm 18 because my parents are polygamous and so um, she was accommodated into the church. And, and she taught a class? Well, she taught a class. She, you know, joined the faithful community. And, um, and I'm sure she was baptized after her 18th birthday. So, yeah, we don't baptize uh, polygamists. Um, That's it was, definitely an angle I hadn't thought of. That's interesting. We, you know, probably the more common situation is where a woman would want to be baptized. And... Um, uh, she had been a polygamist uh, wife, maybe the third or fourth wife. Maybe she was 15 when she married the 45-year-old, you know, because that's what her parents had her do. And, and he's since died. And so, you know, can she be baptized? And there would be a special interview process to, to make sure that um, that was appropriate. And almost always it was. Okay. So um, that would be kind of context for... The way in which we administer that's truly a gospel tangent. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we call it that. <laughs> but um, you know, it it didn't it wasn't pervasive, but it was uh, common enough that our missionaries needed to know how to navigate through that so with church policy. We didn't follow the community of Christ thing and say, well, you, you all can join. No, no, and um, you know, so, you know, it's complex there because. Um, mm -hmm. the, the kind of the legal structure that we have in the United States is far less formal, right? You know, uh, what is a wedding? What is a marriage? Um, uh, you know, they don't register at a town hall. They don't have government in, records, in Africa. at least in this country. Yeah. And um, so they, you know, they're, what is legal in the country is very different with regards to what marriage is than here. And so of course, the church would need to adapt to that, where a tribal ceremony would be sufficient for um, considering the, the couple married. Um, whereas, you know, here, it, 
that wouldn't work, right? It needs to be kind <laughs> well, of a registered marriage certificate. Believe it or not, I've heard the reason why we register marriages is because of Mormons. Because of polygamy, they were trying to identify mm. who was who was a polygamist, and so then all these the state marriage laws came about because uh, of the Mormons, because we had to polygamy. So uh, I would have guessed it was Europe, and they wanted to collect tax on it. <laughs> but in any case, so you know, I, I, and and I think what we did in Sierra Leone, we certainly did with this in the handbook, you know, the bounds of the handbook, and we did it right, um, but we. You know, the church recognized that, that that is a different culture and that um, we could still deal with um, the doctrines that are unalterable for us um, and we could administer them in a cultural context that worked there. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> this brings up another question that I just thought of. So, you know, we have the, the policy that was just recently reversed on the children of gay parents can now be baptized and ordained. Um, but that does not apply to polygamists. Um, do you have a feeling on that? Should we treat children of polygamists the same as children of gays? Well, um, you know, I, these are far beyond my pay grade, Rick. You know, I don't know what the church should do kind of on those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know that as a mission president, I wrote letters requesting exceptions on, on you know, issues of polygamy and, and um, you know, there was a process whereby they were considered and in some cases granted. Um, and so I, you know, I think there, there is a, a willingness to kind of address some flexibility, at least in context of my experience in Africa. So, um, you know, but I, I, you know, I'm so far removed from the considerations that they have. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with David Osler. In our next conversation, we'll talk about different types of church culture across the world. David has some really interesting perspectives on this. We say the church is the same everywhere, but that gospel doctrine class I taught in Chennai was not the same <laughs> as the gospel doctrine class that sometimes you express yeah. frustration with in your ward. Exactly. You know, very, very different. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview and you can also get uh, transcripts available in either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button of course we're also on Facebook Twitter and all the other places uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents and don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.